Gasoline prices hit all-time highs in March 2022. In some places, such as in California, drivers were paying more than $6 at the pump. Diesel, which fuels the freight industry, also hit an all-time high. Jet fuel has also risen to startling highs, affecting the prices of airline tickets and air freight. Oil soared in late February after Russia invaded Ukraine. Oil markets were already dealing with low inventories and rising demand as the world slowly emerged from the coronavirus pandemic. We've never seen prices increase this quickly. Uh, we set a new record for the biggest jump in one week. Russia is the world's third largest producer of oil. Plus, it is part of the influential energy alliance known as OPEC Plus that includes many of the world's biggest producers. But the U.S. barely imports any oil from Russia. The United States goes through almost 20 million barrels of oil per day. The U.S. does import some petroleum products, but only about 8% of those come from Russia. Even so, the U.S. government banned all imports of Russian oil and petroleum products in early March. And the U.S. is the largest oil producer in the world. So why were fuel prices in America pushed upward by events on the other side of the planet? The reality of the situation is that you've got a global market of supply and demand uh, that is very, very tight. So any sort of uncertainty about supply to the global market sends the market into a tizzy. And that's what we're seeing. In 2021, the U.S. produced an average of about 11 million barrels of crude oil per day. So can domestic oil producers like ExxonMobil and Chevron just pump more oil? An oil well is, by far, most productive right after it is drilled. Soon after that, the pressure forcing oil out of the well drops considerably, and the oil flow slows to a trickle. So the only way to significantly boost production is to drill new wells. Drawing oil out of existing wells isn't efficient enough to make up for the shortfall, and there are not many wells that haven't already been tapped anyway. Nothing happens overnight. It's a slow process to go find the oil, uh, go do the exploration, drill the wells, and then produce. So nothing happens in, in a period of less than 60 days. 60 to 90 days is the shortest that you can think of. But that is pretty optimistic. The last several years have presented the industry with some serious challenges. The global pandemic and the boom and bust cycles of the last decade or so have pushed a lot of people out of the industry. There isn't very well qualified personnel available. Many of them have left the industry because of the pandemic and, the, and sort of the last seven years have been really, really hard on the industry. The troubles have also left investors wary of making big capital expenditures. Nobody wants to give you money to explore, drill, and produce oil because the risk associated with it is too high. Because of all the climate risks associated with oil and gas, there's been a very strong pushback on the oil and gas industry as not being a very safe place to put money. The last couple of years have pushed oil companies to shift strategies. After the pandemic, they saw a fundamental shift in their business models. They are now focused on paying down debt, limiting capital expenditures, paying back investors through dividends and buybacks, and basically not growing production. They've said that they're going to grow between zero and 5%, so essentially keeping it flat. And basically, they were burned for a long time by lower oil prices. And the more they pumped, the lower oil prices actually went. And then the pandemic served as this reset for them, and they don't want to return to that. There are also some concerns that investments made now won't pay off. There is a long lag time between when you decide to pump more and when that well is up and running. That can be between six and nine months. So even though prices are really high right now, producers are saying, we're not sure that's gonna be the case, you know, six months or a year from now. So we don't wanna start producing right now and then run the risk of when our oil hits the market, the Russian invasion of Ukraine will be past news and prices will be back down. That does not benefit them. So they don't wanna open the taps. Foreign producers have also been pulling back, most notably the OPEC Plus Alliance, which of course counts Russia among its members. Those countries lowered output after they were burned by cratering demand in 2020 that sent oil prices into negative territory for the first time in history. The last thing they want to do is put out more oil than the market can handle. And they've probably been too disciplined uh, up until the beginning of this year. Now we'll see what happens. 
Petroleum is thought of as a commodity, but there is actually a great deal of variation in the product depending on where it comes from. Crude oil is kind of like Cabernet. There's about 125 different varieties of it. Two varieties serve as benchmarks for oil prices. Brent crude comes from oil fields in the North Sea of Northwest Europe between the UK and Norway. It is the international standard. WTI, or West Texas Intermediate, comes mostly from oil fields in the Permian Basin and is priced in Cushing, Oklahoma. It serves as a benchmark for other crudes from the US and elsewhere in North and South America. WTI and Brent crude typically trade within a few dollars of each other per barrel. Both of them soared above $130 a barrel when oil prices hit their peak after the invasion. Both WTI and Brent are light sweet crudes. A light crude means the oil is less viscous, it flows at a faster rate. If a crude is called sweet, the oil contains lower levels of sulfur. Because of this, it is relatively cheap and easy to refine into high value products like gasoline and diesel fuel. But there are many other crudes, such as the heavy sour crude that tends to come from Russia. There is also Venezuelan heavy crude, and so on. These tend to trade at a steep discount to Brent and WTI. They are generally cheaper because their heavier grade and higher sulfur content makes them more difficult and expensive to refine. However, a refinery can be designed to process these heavier forms of crude oil rather efficiently. Jet fuel is heavier and generally higher value than diesel, and diesel is heavier and higher value than gasoline. Furthermore, many US refineries, particularly along the Gulf Coast, are designed to run most efficiently processing a heavier form of crude oil, not the lighter crudes the US has mostly been producing. That is largely because most US fuel refineries are pretty old and were built before the US started pumping large amounts of light crude. The expectation was we would get into producing heavier crudes, heavier sour crudes would be the norm until we hit the shale revolution. And the shale revolution essentially suddenly said that's not necessarily going to be the place where we will see growth. In fact, we will see growth with natural gas liquids and the lighter sweet crudes that come out of the, out of the shale place. Because U.S. refineries were designed and built before the U.S. oil boom, some amount of heavy sour crude has to be imported from places like Russia to run U.S. refineries most efficiently. It will likely be that way for a while. The United States has not built any new true crude oil refineries of significant size since 1977. The United States also imports some refined petroleum products, such as gasoline, from other countries, including Russia. That is often because certain regions of the country don't always have the refinery capacity to meet local demand. That can happen if, say, a refinery shuts down due to a fire or a natural disaster. In cases like that, domestic producers might not be able to pipe oil or gasoline from one region to another. There's also, of course, the Jones Act, which requires that any products going between U.S. ports be on a U.S. flagged and built ship. So that also limits how much crude can be exported from the Gulf Coast. That often makes it more expensive than simply shipping the oil from another country. So it's a, it's a complicated market, right? Politicians have for years said the country's oil output would push it toward energy independence. But energy independence doesn't really mean what it might sound like. But you still need some of the feedstocks that make money or some of the high octane components that you import. So. We're always going to be importing and, importing and exporting, but I think the balance of trade is going to work in our favor, particularly with crude oil. So the U.S. is a net exporter of energy, but the U.S. is still part of a global energy market, just like every other major oil producer. Oil is a global commodity. Uh, we can't fence the U.S. or take us out of that global system, just like we're seeing uh, computer chip shortages, but we can't remove ourselves from that situation either. Even if we produce some computer chips here, it doesn't fix what's going on outside our borders with drastic impacts to supply and demand. And so the price of oil is affected. Events in just about any oil producing country can and do shock the global system. Saudi Arabia back in 2019 saw a terrorist attack that knocked out 6 million barrels of oil. Gas prices surged. Now we're seeing Russia attack the West and sanctions, which are imperiling the flow of oil, are causing prices to skyrocket. And we've seen hurricanes here in the US that have caused oil prices to jump on the fact that they, uh, a hurricane has shut down oil production. 
In 1973 and 1974, the then members of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, known as OPEC, placed oil embargoes on the United States in retaliation for its support of Israel in the Arab-Israeli War. The U.S. suffered shortages of gasoline severe enough to warrant the creation of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. That's a cluster of storage facilities in underground salt caverns along the Gulf Coast. The SPR is authorized to hold up to about 700 million barrels of oil. It amounts to about a 30-day supply for the entire country. Since oil prices started to rise, that's led to an increase in gas prices, and that is a headache for any official. And Biden has said repeatedly that his administration is working to bring prices down. So one of the tools at their disposal is tapping the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The government tapped the reserve to address rising prices back in November 2021. 50 million barrels of crude from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and it had a kind of short-term effect, but it didn't really do much in the long run. President Biden committed to releasing 90 million barrels in 2022 to offset potential market shocks. On March 16th, President Biden called on oil and gas companies to roll back prices. Gasoline prices tend not to fall as quickly as oil prices, in part because retailers are trying to recoup losses they suffer when prices rise. The winners have been the exploration and production companies, even with the setbacks recently. The break-even price for crude is about $25 a barrel, so everybody can do the math. The losers were probably the retailers, and there's 140,000 of them. They get blamed for the prices above $4, but the reality is they make a lot more money when wholesale prices collapse or crude oil prices collapse, and they really suffer on the way up. Higher prices carry risks for oil producers as well. There's a point at which oil simply becomes too high. And when we see oil at 130, not only does the administration then ask drillers, you know, why aren't you drilling? But it also runs the risk of tipping us into a recession. And a recession is not good for anyone because that means a global growth slowdown, which will, of course, weigh on oil demand. Sooner or later, higher prices tend to motivate competition, which in turn tends to push prices down. But this situation brings many questions. Obviously, Putin's done a lot of damage to the Russian economy, and even if even if he did sign a peace treaty tomorrow, there's a lot of reluctance on the side of Americans to maybe get involved with Putin and Russia again. And that's going to have a profound, long-lasting impact. 